Chapter 5 Jed's sermon went beautifully the following morning, and Hannah was pleased to see the reaction of the other emigrants around her. They all seemed to be happy with the sermon. A few of the men thanked him for preaching after the sermon, and Hannah was pleased that her husband's talents weren't being taken for granted. As they walked back to their wagon for lunch after the service, she asked him something that had occurred to her during the sermon. Are you being paid at all for preaching on our way to Oregon? No, I'm not, but we'll be paid in kind. Different families will make us meals, and if a hunter gets something, and I don't, they'll share meat with us. It's more that we're all working together to make it there, and since I'm a preacher, I can share God's word along the way. Perhaps it will help to keep people's spirits high. That makes sense. I'm still a little worried about Captain Bedwell's wife, but I guess she's going regardless. She is. You'll help her if she needs it along the way, he asked. He knew she had a heart for helping others, so the question was mostly rhetorical. I will. Of course. We're all a community working together. That's the attitude I was hoping you'd have. He sat on the stump while she made biscuits for their lunch. What time are we expected at your mother's house for supper tonight? They always eat promptly at seven. Not a minute before, and not a minute after. Hannah carefully watched the biscuits, making sure she didn't burn them. I take it that's your stepfather's doing? He's a very regimented man, wanting his meals and his clothes just so. I hope you're not that way when you're old like him. Jed laughed. I'll do my best not to be difficult. That's good, because I don't think I'd be as good about it as mother is. She put three biscuits on a plate and added a bit of butter to all three. Then she handed him the jar of jam they'd been eating from for lunch the previous day. I think I may need to make biscuits every night for us to eat on the next day. Think we'll get sick of biscuits after six months? I think if we still have biscuits in six months, we'll need to just be pleased that we have them, and that's that. Jed wasn't going to complain as long as he had food in his stomach. That's a good attitude. I'll work on being the same way, she said with a small grin. She'd never had to eat the same meals over and over, because their family cook had been quite creative. She needed to learn to accept what was available. Good. I wouldn't want to have to drag a complaining wife all the way to Oregon. But he'd do it. Now that he was getting to know her, he wouldn't leave her behind for anything. She chuckled softly. I can't believe we leave tomorrow. It seems so fast. It won't seem fast when we're on the trail. Your feet will ache, and most of the rest of you will too. You'll be doing a lot more work than you've ever done in your life. You're excited, aren't you? He grinned. Just a little. I mean, I wish I could blink my eyes and just be there, but the journey is what has to happen first so I will get there by any means necessary. And now that I'm married, I get a bigger plot of land. That's the only reason you married me, isn't it? You wanted more land. And here I thought you fell in love with my carrot locks the moment you saw me. Your hair looks nothing like carrots. You're more of an autumn sunset while the world is silent around you. Did you ever think about being a poet and not a preacher? Hannah asked, shaking her head. You have a silver tongue. He shrugged. I say what I think. Not a poetic bone in my body. If I tried to rhyme something, people would point and laugh at me. I wouldn't. She settled on the ground with her plate of biscuits in her lap. Does anything else need to be done to prepare for the journey? He shook his head. Nothing. We're going to try to make Sundays a day of rest, even on the trail. Of course, that means you'll be doing laundry on Sundays, and I'm sure some of the men will hunt. It's not possible to have a true day of rest. I can't even fathom what it's going to be like, so why on earth am I excited? Am I just a bit deranged? Everyone in this camp is. Or at least half of us. All the men. 
We're all going west seeking something, and all of the women are going along, because they have to. She sighed. I hope it's not as bad as you make it out to be. I want this to be a good journey. It will be, he said softly. I've been praying and praying about it. God will get us through. And that sermon today was a reminder I needed as much as everyone else did. You made a wonderful suggestion. I'm glad. Hello, Hannah. Preacher. Mary sank down onto the grass beside Hannah, and that's when Hannah realized she wore a split skirt. She wasn't having to be ladylike, because she was cheating. Hannah envied her for being able to do things that most women wouldn't dare try. Does your mother know you're wearing a split skirt? Hannah asked, in a low whisper. Of course not. I made this skirt myself, and I always make sure I wash it. It's my favorite. Mary's eyes twinkled as she responded to her friend. We should make me one. Hannah had heard of the high winds on the prairies, and she had no desire to have her skirts fly over her head. Of course, she had a feeling Jed would think that was going too far. I don't know how you would be able to explain that to your husband. He's not going to look too kindly on a lady wearing a split skirt. And I have practice in hiding the fact that mine is split. You're the first person to notice in three years. Hannah shook her head. People aren't very observant then. Jed looked over at his wife and her friend, a smile tilting the corners of his mouth. What are you two whispering about? he asked. Hannah decided to answer him honestly. I'm thinking about making myself a split skirt. It would look like a normal skirt, but it wouldn't fly up with the high winds. Jed seemed to consider her words for a moment. I don't think that's a bad idea. Hannah looked at Mary with a grin. See? He's the best of husbands. I don't know how you'll find time to make one on the trail, though, Jed added. You're going to be too busy to worry about making skirts, split or otherwise. She was determined to make it happen. I'll do it during our lunches, and I'll do it while I'm waiting for supper to cook. And while I'm waiting for clothes to dry. He laughed. It seems you've thought about this a great deal. Do you have the fabric you need? He wasn't sure if the general store was open on Sundays, but he was sure he could find someone to barter with if it became necessary. Hannah nodded. Mother and I packed a couple of bolts of cloth for me to use for whatever I needed when we arrived in Oregon. I'll make it so full no one will know the difference. I promise. Mary grinned. You do have the best of all husbands, don't you? Now I'm a little upset that you married him before I had a chance. Hannah knew her friend was only joking, but after what Jed had told her about considering courting Mary, she wasn't altogether pleased by the statement. Yup, I married him first, so you don't get a chance, Hannah said with a forced smile. I thought maybe you'd like to walk today. We could try to get another deer for supper. We fed four families last night, one of them being mine. And your family is huge. Hannah said. I really can't though. We're having supper with my mother, and she'll expect us there a little early. I need time to say goodbye. Then just go for a walk with me. We'll leave my musket in camp. I think all the others want to tell your husband how wonderful his sermon was, but they don't want to interrupt the newlyweds. Hannah glanced at Jed, who nodded. Go on. You need to have fun today, while you can. Hannah leaned down and kissed Jed's forehead. Thank you for being the kindest of all the husbands in all the land. He laughed. You won't be saying that when we're both tired and grumpy from months on the trail. Hannah hurried off with Mary, and the two of them walked toward the trail. I always feel drawn to it. I was fascinated by it even before I knew I was going. I hated the idea of the work involved, of course, but I felt like it was my destiny. She'd taken long walks out to the trail with her parents, before her father had died. Really? 
I feel drawn to it as well, but only because I plan to find my own homestead on the other end of it. Did you tell Jed my plans? Hannah shook her head. I decided that was a secret for just the two of us. We don't have to share it with anyone else until you file the deed. Sounds good to me. I feel like I'm encouraging you to lie to your husband, though. There's no lie involved. I didn't tell him you weren't getting your own land once we reach Oregon. Hannah shrugged, refusing to worry about it. That's true. Hannah smiled. I'm excited to see my mother today. Do you know I've never gone so long without spending time with her? Is that crazy? Mary shook her head. No. I'm the same way. But I'm not saying goodbye. I'll see her every day as we trudge toward Oregon. Mary stopped and stooped down, looking at something. Dear Trax makes me wish I'd brought my musket after all. Hannah smiled. I would have been all for it, but I don't want to have to change clothes, and yesterday, we got some blood on my dress. Would that frighten your mother? Mary asked. My ma is used to me coming home, covered in blood and mud and all kinds of other things. Yes, but I think you've had a lot more freedom in your life than I have. It was good while my father was alive, but when my mother remarried, things weren't the same. My stepfather really expected me to act like a lady at all times, and he made it clear that if I didn't, I would bring shame upon his household. He sounds like a real, well the word I want to say might get me struck by lightning. Mary grinned. Ma said I need to watch my language around the preacher's wife anyway. She thinks that you're uptight or something. She needs to get to know you so she understands there's no need to worry. Hannah nodded. I'd like to get to know her as well. I'm not one of those women who is offended by everything. I should probably get offended a little more often than I do. Well, don't just yet. I want my friend first. Mary stopped beside a tree. See this? The deer rub their horns on trees. Oh, really? That's what this is. I'm learning so much from you. Surely there's something I can teach you. You can teach me how to pretend to be a lady, Mary answered quickly. Ma thinks you're a good example for me. She doesn't understand that I'm working hard at bringing you down to my level. Hannah laughed. What she doesn't know won't hurt her, will it? They walked and talked a good long while before finally walking back to Jed's wagon. When he wasn't there, Hannah frowned. He didn't say anything about going anywhere. Mary shrugged. Let's ask around. They went from wagon to wagon, asking everyone if they'd seen the preacher. By the time they got to the fifth wagon, that of Margaret Balling, a young widow with two daughters, they spotted him coming toward them. Rather than running toward her husband as she wanted to do, Hannah made small talk with Margaret. I'm hoping I can get some meat by offering to cook for some of the bachelors on the trail, Margaret said. I can't hunt, but I sure can cook. I'll pass the word along to others, Hannah said automatically. Mary is a good hunter, and she may be able to help you with meat as well. Well, that would be right kind of you, Miss Mitchell. Margaret smiled at Mary, her eyes pleading for help. Hannah's heart went out to the woman. She couldn't imagine losing Jed at such a young age. Why, Mrs. Balling couldn't be more than two or three years older than she was. Mary smiled. Any extras will go straight to your pot. I will try to get you at least a small animal every day. Thank you, Mrs. Balling said, breathing a sigh of relief. Now I don't have to be quite as nervous about this journey. Hannah smiled. You have friends in us. We'll help any way we can. She looked at Mary. I'm heading over to see what Jed's been up to. He usually lets me know if he's leaving. That sounds good. I'm heading back to my family. I might see if I can get a deer for supper and to make jerky out of. I know where to bring any extras now. Mary smiled at Mrs. Balling who smiled back. 
the girls and I would be very grateful. They're sleeping now, or they'd tell you themselves. Hannah felt even worse for Mrs. Balling at that moment, realizing she wouldn't be able to walk with the rest of them. Instead, she'd be driving her own wagon. What a difficult thing for a widow to do, but Hannah had only respect for her. When she got back to her own wagon, she looked at Jed curiously. You didn't say you were going anywhere. I had to find you a wedding present. And a we're leaving tomorrow present. He smiled. Or maybe two presents. Hannah frowned. You didn't need to get me a present. You've been such a good sport so far, making it clear that you don't think you're above sleeping under the stars or walking beside a wagon. I wanted to get you something. Hold out your hands and close your eyes. Hannah obeyed, but she felt silly doing it. When she had a small fluffy, squirming ball of life pressed into each hand, she squealed. Kittens? Really? He grinned. I got you a tom and a female. They're from different litters, so we can breed them for more. She stared at the cute little kittens, who couldn't have been weaned for long. They're perfect. Which is which? The tom is black, and the girl is the tabby. Oh, they're going to be a huge responsibility on the trail, but I don't even care. My very own kittens. After snuggling them both under her chin for a moment, she carefully set the two small critters down and threw her arms around her husband. Thank you. She raised her face and kissed him, surprising him and herself. Jed smiled. I'm glad you like the present. When you told me about having to give away Mr. Whiskers, I just knew I needed to get you a kitten or two. Just don't name them anything silly, he said. So, Mr. and Mrs. Whiskers would be bad, she asked, smiling sweetly. Yes, that would be very bad. I think I'll name them Frederick and Frederica. I'll call the Tom Freddy and the girl Ricca. He groaned. If you have to. Oh, I certainly do. She sat down on the ground with the two kittens who were rolling around biting one another. Now you two are going to stop fighting and fall in love, all right? Jed considered explaining about kitten biology for a moment, but decided against it. If she wanted to believe they had to love each other to make babies, then she could believe that all day long. Who's going to watch them while we're at my parents' for supper? We can't take them. Do you think Miss Mitchell would mind? he asked. I'm sure she wouldn't. I'll go ask her right now. She had taken to wearing an apron around the camp, and she had two pockets. One kitten went into each pocket as she ran off to show Mary. Her friend had just put her musket over her shoulder when she arrived. Oh, I forgot you were hunting. I was hoping you could watch my kittens. Mary laughed. Go ask Mrs. Balling. I'm sure her girls will love to play with them. She shook her head. I can't believe you're taking kittens on the trail. Me neither. Hannah hurried off to Mrs. Balling, explaining the situation. Would you and your girls be willing to mind the kittens while I'm at my parents' house for supper? Mrs. Balling smiled and reached for the kittens. We would be happy to. Amanda? Sally? Come see the kittens. Two little blonde girls climbed down out of the wagon and approached the kittens. Satisfied her babies were in good hands, Hannah went back to Jed. Can we walk into town? she asked. I need to build up my muscles as quickly as possible. She was already sore from all the walking she'd done, but she didn't care. She was going to be a pioneer in one more day, and she had to prepare for it. Hopefully her muscles would build up enough that she wouldn't constantly be sore as they traveled. Jed smiled and nodded, and the two struck out toward town. I'm glad you like the kittens. Like? I love them. Thank you so much for thinking of them. They're just the distraction I'll meet on the trail. She hesitated for a moment but then told him what Margaret Balling had said about being willing to cook in exchange for meat in her pot. 
I'm afraid they won't be able to make it all the way to Oregon if they don't get some help. Jed nodded. Thanks for letting me know. I'll talk to the single men that are part of this train. There aren't a lot of them, so it won't be hard to do. Good. I think I'll try to walk with her girls during the day, because she'll be driving her wagon. We'll all find ways to help, Jed told her. That's why a group of us go together. Good. I don't want to have to worry about her the whole way there. They had arrived at her mother's house, and she walked in, calling out. Mother, we're here. Her mother came running out of the parlor and flung her arms around Hannah. Do you realize this may be the very last time we ever see each other? Hannah frowned. I hadn't thought of it that way, but you're right. It might be. She didn't let herself cry, but she was deeply saddened. We're going to write to each other, and you will always be welcome in my home in Oregon. I don't see Mr. Gatlin and myself traveling the Oregon Trail anytime soon. The sadness in her mother's eyes compounded Hannah's own feelings greatly. I suppose not. Hannah smiled. Tonight is going to be a happy memory for both of us. We're not going to be weeping and worrying about the trip. Instead, we're going to be two women enjoying one another's company. Over supper, they sat together, and each of them talked about silly things they had done. It was a beautiful trip down memory lane for each of them. Hannah could see Mr. Gatlin talking to Jed, who simply nodded constantly. She didn't once hear him say a thing. When the evening was over, Hannah wrapped her arms around her mother and held on tight. I promise I will write often. You don't have to worry about me, mother. Mother sniffled back a tear. I promised myself I wouldn't cry tonight. She dashed her tear away quickly. I want to remember you with smiles, not with tears. You know how much I love to write. I will be putting pen to paper often on this journey of ours, and I'll send you a letter from every fort. Hannah wasn't sure she'd have the time to do so, but she would find it. Her mother was too important to her not to. I'll try to have letters waiting for you at those forts, her mother responded. With a last embrace, Hannah and Jed were gone, walking through the quiet town to return to the campsite. Are we really ready for this journey? Hannah asked, looking back over her shoulder only once. It was a good thing her husband wasn't lot, and she wasn't turned into a pillar of salt, but she couldn't leave without that last glance backward. She now understood what had happened with the other woman, not wanting to leave everything behind. We are ready. Tomorrow is the day I've been working toward for months. It's the day we strike out for land of our own, and a congregation that I can teach. We're going to Oregon. Hannah smiled a little, not missing his enthusiasm. It's going to be hard, but the rewards will be worth it. That's my wife. You know you can do it. We'll do it all together. He took her hand and brought it to his lips, and all at once, she wished they'd had a normal wedding night. She knew neither of them would want to wait much longer before they engaged in the marital act, and she didn't really want to have to try to find a private place on the trail. Chapter 6 March 29, 1852, Jed We left for Oregon today, and it was a hard day, to say the least. My dear bride is sore and tired, but she kept her spirits up and cooked supper for me, just as agreed upon. We had to cross the Missouri River this morning, and it was much simpler than expected. We were ferried across the river, and we stayed close, walking along the banks of the river and setting up camp here after a ten-mile drive. All of the wagons are in a circle, and we are all encamped within the circle. Hannah spent the first day on the trail walking with Mary and her siblings, whom she was watching over, and watching over Mrs. Balling's daughters. The girls were excited to start the journey, but once they'd had lunch, which was only about a mile after everyone was ferried across the Missouri River, they became cantankerous. They didn't like to use a hole in the ground to do their business. They didn't like it any better when all the women stood in a circle around them with their skirts spread to keep anyone from seeing them when they went. 
They really didn't like having to use a leaf to get the feces off their bodies when they were finished. All in all, they were not happy with their first day on the trail. Hannah suggested to Mrs. Balling that both of her daughters would do well with a nap in the wagon, and with the other woman's agreement, she lifted both girls in. Once they were settled, Hannah moved back and walked with Mary, whose mother was now there. It was Hannah's first opportunity to meet Mrs. Mitchell. It's so good to meet you, Mrs. Mitchell. I truly enjoy Mary's companionship. Mrs. Mitchell shook her head. Just make sure she learns your good habits, and you don't learn her bad ones. Hannah couldn't help the laugh that escaped her. I'm not learning anything from Mary that my husband doesn't approve of. It was true, but she knew Mrs. Mitchell probably wouldn't be as lenient with her as Jed was. As they walked, Hannah had the kittens in her pocket some, and sometimes let them down to walk. Without fail, they would start rolling around and biting one another within minutes of being put on the ground, and Hannah would grumble and carry them again. She honestly wasn't sure which would hurt her arms more, carrying the kittens or driving the wagon. The day, she was told, would be like most days on the trail. They'd been woken up by a shot into the sky, and they'd had a short while to have breakfast, make coffee, take care of their bodily needs, and get their wagons reloaded for the day's drive. Then they'd crossed the river and started walking. By the end of that first day, Hannah was certain she would never be able to move again, but she was careful not to complain. What was the use? Everyone else would have been hurting as well. Maybe not everyone else had been raised without much exercise, but they would still be sore. She thought longingly of her bed back in Independence and her bath that would be filled twice a week with warm water and would magically be taken away when she was finished, the water dumped out, and the tub cleaned for when she was next ready for a bath. Mary didn't seem at all bothered as she walked with her rifle thrown over one shoulder, and she shot three rabbits. She quickly gave one to Mrs. Balling, and the other two she claimed as supper for her family. Mary, I never know if I should be pleased that you provide meat or scold you because you do it in the manliest way possible, her mother said. Mary grinned. Just be happy I provide meat, of course. Just before they stopped for the day, Mary hit one more rabbit, and she gave it to Hannah. I'll show you how to skin it when we stop. My brother can do the ones for my family. Hannah nodded, feeling tired and a bit overwhelmed. What had she been thinking that she could do this? She'd walked all day, and now she was expected to cook supper. It was going to be a very long six months. She already felt ready to drop to the ground and get someone, anyone, to return her to the home where she belonged. When they finally camped for the evening, Hannah followed Mary, and she learned how to skin a rabbit. Mary was a good teacher, telling her what to do, but making Hannah do it. Hannah followed every step her friend told her to make, even though the thought of cooking something that had been hopping through the fields just moments before turned her stomach. When the animal had been skinned, Hannah stared at it. How do I cook a rabbit? She wasn't sure she even knew people ate rabbit until that moment. Rabbits were sweet little creatures you fed and watched as they played happily. You've never had rabbit? Mary asked. Hannah shook her head. No, never. Make a stew out of it. Now I wouldn't remove the meat from the bones. Just let the preacher know that's how you cooked it, so he knows to watch out for bones. You should have enough for a good noonday meal, tomorrow as well. Make some biscuits with it, and you have breakfast, a noonday meal, and tonight's supper all at once. Hannah nodded. Are you sore at all from the walking? She needed to rub the knots out of her legs, but she didn't want to do it in front of her friend. Mary shook her head with a grin. I walked five miles each way to school. Walking is easy. I'll be as strong as you in a few days, won't I? Hannah could hear the pleading tone of her own voice, and she knew she was being silly, but she was so sore, she wasn't sure she could keep going. You will. I promise. They parted ways, 
and Hannah realized that Mrs. Balling had her wagon parked right next to hers and Jed's. She'd make sure to help the other woman all she could. Jed was off somewhere with the livestock, and she collected some wood for supper. She knew there was a bit in the wagon, but Jed had said that was for further down the road when wood wouldn't be readily available. Here it was easy to find, some big logs had even been left behind by other caravans, though Hannah was relatively certain their train was the first of the year. She made the fire, and then she cut up the rabbit as best she could. The kittens played at her feet as she did, and she was happy they hadn't wandered off. They seemed to know she was their protector, and they needed to stay with her. The stew took a couple of hours to cook, and her mouth was watering most of that time. She could smell how good the stew would be. There were few spices to be had, but she made do, and when she served Jed his meal, he smiled. This is really good. I think so too. Are you wanting to play cards with other couples again tonight? she asked. He shook his head. Not tonight. I think everyone's too tired to think about cards or music or anything. Once we're more used to the daily chores of being on the trail, we'll all do better with it. I certainly hope you're right. Already, it felt as if her enthusiasm was gone. She wanted to turn tail and go home, but that wasn't the answer. No, she would have to be strong and just handle it all. She wrapped the biscuits for breakfast the following day in a piece of cloth and then she left the stew right in the pot and covered it. It was cold enough at night that there was no worry about the food spoiling. She spooned out a portion of the stew and put it in a bowl for the kittens to share, and then she added a small bit of milk to another bowl. The kittens lapped it up happily. She decided to feed them a little of their supper and some milk every day until they started hunting for their own food. She washed the few dishes they'd used right in the river, and carried them back up to the wagon. The sun was setting, but it was still early. Would I seem like a sloth if I went to bed now? Jed laughed. Look around you. It seemed that most people had been exhausted from the day's work and decided to sleep early as well. With as cold as it was, it took more energy to do most things. The tents had all been erected with a few of the unmarried men sleeping outside in a bedroll. She smiled. I think I'm going to write in my journal very quickly and then follow suit. Today was long and hard, but tomorrow will be just like today. She nodded toward the tent he'd set up while she was cooking supper. Thanks for making sure we had shelter. We'll leave the river tomorrow and head for Mosquito Creek, which shouldn't be covered in mosquitoes, he said with a smile. We always want to camp on water when we can, because we'll need it. The barrel of water in the wagon is never to be used for anything but cooking. All right? That makes sense to me. She covered a yawn with her hand. Climbing into the wagon, she lit a small lantern and quickly wrote in her journal about her day. She talked about the time with Mary and her mother, and watching Mrs. Balling's girls, and skinning her first rabbit. She was sure there would be many more to come. As soon as she'd finished, she turned down the lantern and stowed her journal back in her trunk. Gathering the bedding she and Jed would share, she took it outside and laid one blanket on the ground of the tent and left the other three to cover them. When they snuggled closely together, it provided enough warmth that they made it through the night. She wondered what would have happened to him without her body heat. Once they were bedded down for the night, she said a silent prayer, thanking God for getting them to their first destination safely. There would be many more destinations and many more days to travel, but they would take those one day at a time. Asterisk. Hannah woke again to the sound of the gunshot, and for just a moment, she snuggled under the covers closer to her husband. I want to stay in bed all day, she said softly. He wrapped an arm around her and held her close. I would, too, but it's time for work. He yawned right in her ear, and she sat up. I'll get the fire started, she said with another yawn, doing her best to force herself to wake up. 
I'll go help make sure the livestock didn't wander too far during the night. He sat up, pulling his suspenders over his shoulders. He went to the wagon and drew on his heavy coat and went to join the other men, while Hannah started the fire for their coffee. By the time he got back to camp, she had the coffee made, and she had even melted butter on their biscuits and added jam. He sat down on the ground beside her, still yawning. Two of the Jensen's cows wandered off during the night. I got them, and they're back where they belong. Good. We'll meet all of our livestock when we get to Oregon. Hannah handed him his cup of coffee and his plate of biscuits and jam. How far do you think we'll go today? The goal is always 20 miles per day. Whether we can do that is a completely different story. We did 10 yesterday, but it took almost half the day to get the wagons ferried across the water. I will do everything I can to keep up. She sighed. I don't think I told you I have new names for the kittens. Oh? What did you decide on? He hoped it wasn't one of her silly names for the animals. I named the girl Naughty. He laughed. And the Tom is nice? He asked, grinning. Oh, no. The Tom is naughtier. Now those are good names for those two. He poured a little cream from the milk bucket out into a saucer for the kittens, and they both gobbled it up greedily. A short while later, they were ready to move on. Hannah walked with Amanda and Sally, holding their hands and talking to them. She pointed out any animals she saw and any other things she could think of that might be of interest to two little girls. Mary walked beside her, musket at the ready. I'm going to try for a deer today. That would be enough food for all three families and more. You've taken it upon yourself to feed Mrs. Balling's family every night, haven't you? Hannah asked. Of course, I have. Just because I carry a musket doesn't mean I don't have a soft heart. Mary looked past Hannah. Jeremiah, get out of those weeds. We follow the trail for a reason. A small boy, who couldn't have been more than five, hurried over to Mary. Sorry, Mary. I thought I saw a snake. Mary closed her eyes for a moment. If you see a snake, it could be poisonous. We don't want to bury you in Iowa now, do we? She pointed to a human skull on the ground not too far off the trail. No. I guess not. I'm going to run up ahead and see what the wagons are doing. Mary shook her head at Hannah. He's the most curious boy I've ever met. He constantly needs to be learning new things and seeing new things. He's going to be dead by the time we reach Nebraska. Ma took half the children today, just so I could keep a better eye on Jeremiah. Hannah shook her head, glad the girls were being so cooperative. At the moment, at least. It's strange to see so much barren land after being on the banks of the Missouri so long. Jed said we're looking to camp on Mosquito Creek tonight. It sounds itchy to me. Me too. I guess that's one of the benefits of traveling when it's colder than a witch's tit. Not as many bugs around to bite us. Hannah giggled at the crude expression. Well, I'm glad we won't be eaten alive by bugs at least. Not until it warms up some anyway. Do you know if we're stopping for the noon meal today? Mary asked. Why wouldn't we? Hannah asked. Won't we stop for a noon meal every day? If they were going to walk all day every day, then they needed to stop for food, in her opinion. How else would they have the energy to keep going? Probably not. We're trying to make really good time to beat the winter to Oregon. I'm not sure if it's even possible, but I know the men have been talking about it since we all camped together in Independence. Doesn't Independence feel forever away now? I lived there my whole life until yesterday, and now it seems almost as if it's just a distant memory. Mary nodded. It does feel that way. It feels like the only real people in the whole world are the ones on this journey with us. Will we even remember how to talk to people when we get there? I hope we will, Hannah said. 
I'm a preacher's wife, after all, and I'm going to have to act all proper after the trail. Jed is fine with a split skirt for now, but I can tell you with a certainty that he is going to expect me to act like a lady after we arrive in Oregon. He probably will expect it. And I'll be off on my homestead wearing trousers and shooting at any critter I see. Mary grinned. We'll have to enjoy being equals while we're on the trail, because we certainly weren't before, and we won't be after. We'll always be equals, because we'll always be women working as hard as we can toward a goal. Now if one of us lazed about and did nothing, then she would be inferior. There is absolutely nothing inferior about you, Mary Mitchell. Mary grinned. I guess not. She stopped walking and brought her musket to her shoulder and shot off into the distance. She raised a hand in victory as the buck she was shooting at fell. I got him. We have supper. Keep going. I'll catch up. Hannah didn't see what other choice she had, so she and the girls continued walking alongside the wagons. They stopped a short while later for the noon meal, and after returning the girls to their mother, Hannah stretched out her legs as she put cold stew into two bowls, taking both to Jed on the wagon. She climbed up beside him and ate a few bites of stew. It certainly wasn't as good cold as it was warm, but it was palatable. Mary just shot a deer. She plans to feed half the camp with it tonight, Hannah said with a smile. I've never seen anyone handle a gun the way she does. She really is skilled, Jed agreed. How are things going today? she asked. Are we making good time? We are. We should be at Mosquito Creek after another couple of hours of travel, and we'll spend the night there. And what's the next thing we'll reach after that? She knew Jed had a map that he was constantly referring to that told him where they were going and what landmarks they'd see first. Wolf River is where we'll head tomorrow. We'll need to use rafts to cross that river from what I understand. We'll have wood and water, then. That's what we're looking for every night, isn't it? Jed nodded with a smile. That's exactly what we're looking for every night. There'll be a lot of nights we have to use buffalo chips to cook with or to warm ourselves by, but one of those nights will not be tonight. Hannah wrinkled her nose. I suppose it'll be my job to collect them? He grinned. You are the one who needs a fire to cook, after all. You need a wife to cook for you, maybe you could help her out with the buffalo chips. We'll see. He kissed her as she hopped down. The gunshot had sounded. It's time for our afternoon walk. You make it sound a great deal more leisurely than it really is. Are you complaining? He asked. How can I complain when there are people who have it so much harder than we do? She couldn't get Mrs. Balling out of her mind. Her job was so much harder than Hannah's was. That's a very good attitude. Hannah nodded, smiling at him as she headed toward the Balling wagon. Do you want me to walk with the girls? she asked. Mrs. Balling shook her head. No, I think they're ready for their nap. Your help is greatly appreciated, though. Mary shot a deer for supper, so you don't have to worry about an empty pot tonight. What would we do without sweet Miss Mitchell? Survive on biscuits and beans, most likely, Hannah said. I'll check on you in an hour or two. Thank you. Hannah walked back to Mary, who was again accompanied by her mother. Mrs. Mitchell, it's good to see you out and about this afternoon. I was out this morning as well, but I was walking on the other side of the wagons, Mrs. Mitchell responded. It's easier to keep some of my younger boys from causing mischief if they're apart. Sounds like a good plan then. Hannah felt the kittens getting restless, so she put them down to walk again, watching them closely. I think Naughty and Naughtier are ready for a little bit of walking as well. I've had them in my pockets all morning. Mary grinned. I'm sure they're ready to be free for a little while. Both friends love to watch the kittens exploring their new reality every day. I just worry one of them will be hurt by a wild animal, 
Hannah said, watching as they ran beside one of the wagons for a bit. I don't want anything to happen to them. Of course not, Mary said. They're so sweet. Mary spotted something Hannah couldn't see. Ma, the twins are rolling in the dirt fighting again. Jeremiah. Mrs. Mitchell groaned. Jessie. She looked at Mary. We'll split up again. I think I'll go walk with Mrs. Bedwell. She tries to keep her boys separated as well. After Mrs. Mitchell was gone, Hannah watched Mary slouch a little and she immediately looked more like the Mary Hannah was used to. You make me laugh, Hannah said. You act all proper around your mother, but when it's just the two of us, you seem to turn into someone else. You're right. I turn into the real Mary as soon as Ma turns her back. Mary shook her head. I hate having to act one way for Ma and another way for everyone else. It makes me feel like a hypocrite. I can understand that, Hannah said. I wish there was something you could do. Eventually, there will be. I just have a few more months of being under Ma's thumb, and then I'll be free to do what I want. I'm glad there's an end in sight. When they reached their campsite on the Mosquito Creek, Hannah immediately gathered her firewood. She wasn't about to get up again after she sat. She even grabbed a bucket full of water for the few dishes. She wondered if she could get Jed to rub her feet. She'd happily return the favor by rubbing his. Of course, his probably didn't hurt like hers did. He was spending his days in the wagon. When Jed joined her after dealing with his own chores for the evening, she was frying up venison steaks. Mary's deer had once again fed much of the camp, and they hadn't had to get into their store of beans for supper. Hannah was pleased because she didn't particularly enjoy eating beans. Jed collapsed on the ground beside her, rubbing his upper arms. One more day behind us. Only about 178 left. Hannah groaned. Why would you tell me that? I'm counting down. I want to cheer you up. She shook her head. You will not be able to cheer me up until you can tell me there are two days to go. He laughed. Supper smells good. Thank you. The steaks will be ready in about twenty minutes. He nodded. Did we drink all the coffee? We did. Would you like me to make another pot? That would be nice if you don't mind. I don't usually drink coffee with supper, but I feel like it's the best option. He blinked a few times, trying to get the sight of the prairie out of his vision. Our next stop is Wolf River, right? she asked. It made her feel better to always know what their goal was. It made the time go faster somehow. It is. We should be there by this time tomorrow, and we'll camp on the river and then cross over in the morning. It'll probably be a hard day. Hannah shrugged. Better to have fewer hard days than more easy ones. We want to be settled by winter, and that means we have to go as quickly as we can, right? Exactly. It depends how high the Wolf River is if we can cross it with rafts or if we'll have to make canoes. We're all hoping the rafts will be enough. They're left from one caravan to the next. Someone has to go over and get them, but that's better than building new ones. What do you think? Will the water be low enough? She asked, slightly worried that the water would be high and they would lose precious travel time. I think we'll be able to use the rafts. It doesn't look like rain and all of the creeks and rivers have been low so far. We should make it with ease. Oh good. Then we won't lose time. You're anxious to be there, aren't you? She shrugged. I'm anxious to be there before winter. We don't need snow impeding us when we build our new house, or when we build the church. Very true. How's your split skirt coming? He asked. She sighed. I haven't sewn a stitch. Between the bawling girls and the kittens, my mind is on anything but my clothing. Maybe you can do some work on it on Sunday. We plan to take a day of rest for us as much as for the animals. 
and for the laundry. She groaned. I am not sure I'm ready for laundry on the trail. There's really no choice. I know. I'll do it, and I won't complain. You are a good wife to me, Hannah. Thank you. I'm trying hard. It shows. Hannah wrote in her journal again before bed. It was time for them to reach Wolf River. They were going to keep moving along the trail, no matter what. Chapter 7 March 31, SUP ST slash SUP, 1852, Hannah's Journal The days are so long, and the nights are much too short. Today was our third day on the trail, and I'm already exhausted and want to cry with how much I ache in every bone of my body. Mary Mitchell's brother managed to shoot himself in the foot with her musket today. Thank heavens we have a doctor traveling with our train, and he came to the rescue, patching up Jeremiah. The child has been into everything since before we started on the trail, so I'm certain he will heal well and will be up and about soon, and back into making as much mischief as he can. We are camped on the Wolf River tonight, and we expect to be able to cross in the morning on rafts that were found on the river. Bob Hastings volunteered to swim across the river to retrieve the rafts. He is a brave soul, to be willing to swim through that icy water to help the rest of us. We had a fire ready for him along with many blankets when he returned. Hopefully, he will be up to helping us all cross the river in the morning, but even if he isn't, he has made it possible for all of us to cross the river, and it will probably take another half day. My aching feet make me pleased we are spending the morning crossing tomorrow, and there will be no walking. I'm certain I'll regret saying this in the morning, but for now, it is the truth. Wednesday was another long, hard day for Hannah and the rest of the emigrants. They had lost their early excitement for the journey and now were dealing with the daily drudgery of the trail. Hannah walked beside Mary, who had her musket on her shoulder throughout the morning, as always. They chatted about their lives before the trail, and Amanda and Sally walked alongside them a little more cheerfully that day. You girls seem very happy today, Hannah finally said. Did something happen? Amanda, the older of the girls, shrugged. No, but we like seeing the animals. The animals do bring joy, don't they? Hannah said with a smile. Little Sally nodded her head. I love the kitties. Hannah looked around her. She hadn't thought of her kittens for a few minutes, and she worried they may have left them, but they were following along, hoping for the food they knew Hannah had for them. When the train stopped for the noon meal, Hannah went to their wagon and got out food she'd cooked the night before, splitting it into two bowls and carrying half to Jed. Just as she was settling herself on the wagon seat beside him, she heard a gunshot. Assuming a member of the party had gotten an animal for supper, she smiled. Someone will have meat tonight. Then there was a scream from behind them, and Jed all but leapt off the seat and ran back. He found Jeremiah Mitchell lying on the ground with blood pouring from his foot. Doc, he yelled as loudly as he could. Did you shoot yourself in the foot? He wanted to call him a fool boy, but that would do no good with a boy as headstrong as Jeremiah. The doctor hurried back to Jed and looked at the boy on the ground, shaking his head. Played with your sister's musket, did you? The disgust on the doctor's face was clear. They all knew the boy should have been watched more closely. More and more people gathered around as the doctor went back for his medical bag. Captain Bedwell groaned. He's going to have to ride after Doc patches him up. We don't need to be slowed down by a fool boy who couldn't keep his hands off a gun. He walked away shaking his head while everyone else worked to make the boy more comfortable. He was not an easy man, and he had no pity for fools. He had a schedule to keep, and by God, they would keep it. Mr. Mitchell grabbed Mary by the arm and dragged her off, and Hannah could hear his yells coming from wherever he took her, but at least she couldn't quite make out the words he was saying. She felt terrible for her friend, knowing she would blame herself for her brother's accident, and being taken to task right after it happened would only hurt, not help. 
Hannah knelt on the ground and grasped Jeremiah's hand while his mother put a pillow under his head. Mrs. Balling carefully removed the boy's boot. After removing Jeremiah's sock, the doctor poured a good measure of whiskey over the gunshot wound and ignored the boy's screams of intense pain. Hannah was revolted by the look of his foot as the sock came off, but she swallowed hard to keep her lunch in her stomach. There would be no time to cook something else if she vomited. The trail was going to make her a stronger person, or it was going to kill her. There was no other option. They were slowed down by about an hour by the time they took care of Jeremiah and settled him in the back of one of his parents' wagons and got back on their way, but Jed was optimistic. We should still be able to get to the Wolf River this afternoon, and we'll be able to camp there. Unless some other fool boy shoots himself or something, he told Hannah, shaking his head. No one was very sympathetic about the accident. Instead, they thought the boy should have had the sense God gave a lizard, and he apparently didn't. As Hannah walked beside Mary that afternoon, her friend was mostly quiet. The girls were napping, as they always did in the afternoons, and Hannah was worried for Mary. Are you all right? Mary turned to Hannah, with tears pouring down her cheeks. Pa has always told me never to leave my musket sitting around, and this is why. I hurt my brother. No, Mary, you didn't. You were a little careless, true, but I'm sure your brother has been told never to touch a musket as well. You can't take all the blame for this. Besides, his foot is mending, and he gets to ride for a few days. Mary sniffled. I feel like I should ride with him to take care of him. Your mother is riding with him. She'll take good care of him. Hannah hugged her friend for a moment. He'll be all right. What if his foot becomes putrid? What if he dies, and it's all my fault? It won't be. I know your father taught your siblings as well as he taught you, and he wouldn't have let your brother get to be five without teaching him not to play with guns, would he? Mary sighed, shaking her head. Of course not, but he would never have touched it if I hadn't left it laying around loaded, now would he? Of course not. But it's still not your fault. You're going to have to figure out how not to beat yourself up over it. The doctor has taken care of him, and you have to trust that he's going to be just fine. Hannah hoped her words were actually reaching her friend. She didn't know what else to say that would convince her. I'll try. They walked a little later in the day that way, but true to his word, Captain Bedwell got them to the Wolf River late that afternoon. For once, Hannah didn't take the time to worry about all the pain she was in. Instead, she simply got to work making supper. There was no meat that evening, so she made a filling supper of beans and biscuits. It wouldn't have been her first choice of a meal, but it would see them through. As she ate the beans, she swallowed down her negative feelings about them and reminded herself how thankful she was to have food to cook. It was their first time to get into the bean stores, and they'd already been on the road for three days, though it felt like three weeks. It was very strange how slowly time passed on the trail. Her time before they'd started the journey felt like it was in the distant past. Jed helped the others make sure the livestock were rounded up before he joined her. Right after supper, Bob Hastings is going to swim across the river for the rafts. Unless there's a sudden downpour tonight, and it doesn't look like there will be, we should have an easy time crossing. We'll go over first thing in the morning and keep traveling along the Wolf River for a few days. We'll have water, meat, and wood for a while yet. Tomorrow is only half a day walking then, right? He nodded with a smile. Are your feet still hurting you that badly? He hated that the trip was causing her pain, but it made sense. It wasn't a picnic for any of them. They are. I want to stick them in the river, to numb them. Numb would be better than this constant pain I feel. I'll rub your feet later, after we get the tent set up. Hannah perked at the idea. I can't ask you to do that. You've been driving all day, and I would bet your hands and arms are as sore as my feet. I'm fine. 
We could put some liniment on them tonight as well if you'd like. She shook her head. I hate the smell of liniment. I'll be trying to escape my own stench if we do that. He laughed. I'll just rub them then. It's really no problem. While the ladies did the supper dishes, all the men went to the river to watch Bob swim across to get to the rafts. He was smart about it and put the first he saw in the river before grabbing a stick to float the other raft across in front of him. It looked like he was playing some sort of odd game, but he did a good job of it. When he'd gotten both across, he hurried to the fire closest to the bank. After that excitement was over, and Jed knew Bob was in good hands, he walked over to Hannah and set up the tent. I'm guessing you don't want people to see you get a foot massage. They might think she was being pampered by him, and he didn't think either of them wanted that. No. I don't want people to think I'm not capable of this journey, because I'm just as capable as anyone else. Do you have any idea how Mrs. Bedwell is doing? She had barely seen the sickly woman since they'd left Independence. He shook his head. She doesn't seem to be walking with the others. She's riding in the wagon with Captain Bedwell today, and the boys are walking and finding all the mischief they can. Of course, they are. As you would have done at their age. Hannah could see the spark of mischief that was still in his eyes. She hoped he didn't plan to play silly jokes on his congregants. Yes, I would have, he said. I'm not even ashamed of it. Nor should you be. She got out their blankets and got them organized and settled herself on the ground inside the tent. Does this work for you? He nodded. You might want to remove your shoes and socks though. She laughed. I thought about that but I wanted to make sure we were all settled for the night first. That makes sense. He waited as she removed her socks and shoes. Taking one foot onto his lap, he rubbed the knots that he found. I'm not sure if I'm doing this right. I'm not either, but it feels good so please keep going. He laughed. What a pair we are. After he'd finished with her feet, he lay down beside her. Feel better? She nodded. I'm not sleepy yet, though. Neither am I. He looked at her, and it was still just a tad bit light out, and he could see her green eyes and her beautiful smile. Without thinking about what he was doing, he leaned toward her and touched his lips to hers lightly. Hannah had become worried that he didn't find her attractive, so when he kissed her, she turned more fully to him and wrapped her arms around him. She'd been waiting for this kiss, and it was finally happening. She was going to make the most of it. His arms came around her, and he pressed her to him more fully, one of his legs wrapping around hers. His hands began to roam over the front of her, cupping her breast through the thin material of her dress and chemise. She wound her fingers through his hair, clutching him closer to her. Do you want to go for a walk away from everyone? he whispered, his breathing ragged. We'd have to stop to walk away, she complained, not wanting to stop touching and kissing. She clung to him to keep him from moving away from her. If we walk away, then we can finish this without worry of being interrupted, he said. He said a silent prayer, she'd say yes. When he'd agreed to not consummate the marriage, he'd had no idea what having almost contact with her would do to his body. He needed her to agree to go for that walk. He had never made love, but he had an idea it would not be a quiet thing. She pulled back and picked up the blanket they'd been lying on to take with them. Let's go. She wasn't even going to stop to put shoes on. He grinned, realizing they were finally going to make love. Yes, he knew they'd only been married for a few days, but it felt like much longer with the time they'd spent together. They walked a short distance from the campsite and she spread the blanket out close to the river. They'd walked the whole way in silence, hoping no one would realize what they were about to do. Hannah walked to Jed and wrapped her arms around his neck, kissing him once again. It didn't take long for the feelings of need to come back, 
and her nipples tightened with the cold and the electricity that was spreading between their bodies. He cupped her bottom as he kissed her, pulling her close to the place where he needed her the most. I need to touch your skin. Hannah nodded, turning so he could unbutton her dress. When he'd finished, she dropped her dress to the ground, and next came her undergarments. It felt strange to her to be completely naked outside in front of a man, but it felt glorious. She hoped their house in Oregon was far enough from neighbors they could make love outside from time to time. He stepped to her, kissing her again, touching all of her, as he did. Finally, he pushed her down onto the blanket she'd spread. He kissed her neck and then moved his lips down to her nipple, taking one of the tight points into his mouth. You're beautiful, he mumbled against her breast, as his hand stroked all over her naked body. His hand went to the spot between her legs where her body ached, and he carefully stroked there, trying to make sure she was ready for him, but he wasn't exactly sure what he was looking for. He was glad his first time was with her, but he wished he could have found a manual on how to do it right. Finally, he couldn't wait another moment, and he rolled away from her and stood, unbuttoning his shirt as quickly as he knew how. When he dropped his pants, he groaned aloud when his member was freed and no longer constrained by his trousers. He joined her again on the blanket and kissed her, bringing her back quickly to the fevered state she'd been in before he left her. When he joined his body with hers, he gasped at the feeling. He held still for a moment, loath to hurt her. Her hands roamed over his back, and she sighed. Are we finished? He laughed. We'd barely started, love. Love. He'd called her love. Through the pain of that first time with him, it was all she could think about. He'd called her love. It was over much too soon for Jed's tastes, but he pulled her close to him as the cold wind dried the sweat on their bodies. Neither spoke for a long while, but finally, Hannah whispered, I'm getting too cold. We need to get back to camp where the other blankets are. He kissed her once again. Thank you. She laughed. Why are you thanking me? It was my marital duty, and if I'm honest, it felt good. Hannah thought back to the talk her mother had with her about what the marital act was like, and she found she'd had no desire to plan meals in her head. It was so much more fun to feel everything that was happening. He caught her lips one last time. Let's get dressed and get back to camp. Maybe we should start pitching our tent far away from the others. He shook his head. No, we'll just sneak away whenever we want to. He reached down a hand and helped her to her feet, and they quickly dressed. Hannah didn't bother with the buttons on the back of her dress when she was just going to sleep anyway. When they got back to the tent, they smoothed out the blanket together and shared their sleeping space, sleeping in one another's arms. Just before she fell asleep, she remembered her journal entry for the day, but she decided she would write it in the morning as if she'd written it then. She really didn't want to skip a day writing, but lying in her husband's arms was infinitely more important at the moment. The following morning, the first thing Hannah did was scramble for her journal and write down her thoughts, carefully omitting the events of the night before. She certainly didn't want her grandchildren reading about the first time she'd made love with their preacher grandfather. The shot still hadn't sounded when she was finished, so she moved to the spot where she'd started a fire the night before. The morning at least would be spent in trying to raft all the wagons across the river, and she knew she wouldn't be walking nearly as much, which was good because she was now sore in new places. She started the fire and got a pot of coffee going, and then packed up as much as she could of their camp. Jed emerged at the sound of the gunshot into the sky as he did every morning, but the first thing he did was walk around behind Hannah and wrap his arms around her, resting his cheek atop her head. Good morning, love. She felt herself melting back against him. I thought I'd cook a real breakfast this morning, since I woke early. And when he called her love, her heart beat faster. How had she not known the instant she saw him that he would be the man she would love for the rest of her days? 
And what is in this real breakfast? he asked. Flapjacks. That sounds delicious. If you look carefully, there is some maple syrup back there. I know we'll both want the sugary sweetness of that to add to our days. She laughed, turning to face him. I told Mary once you were the very best of all husbands, and I see now that I didn't exaggerate even a little bit. You truly are the best of all husbands. He leaned down and kissed her. I need to go help round up the livestock and get ready for our turn to cross the river. Once everything is readied, I'll come back and eat with you. Lots of coffee, he called over his shoulder as he went to help the men. Someone had suggested keeping the livestock penned in the midst of their wagon circle, but Captain Bedwell hadn't liked the idea. He wished the man would be more bending in things they could decide as a community. True to his word, Jed was back as she finished making his pancakes. She put a dab of butter on them and then added the syrup, which she had to find in their food storage. Pouring him a cup of coffee, she handed him both, and put a bit of the milk he brought her into a bowl for the kittens. He talked of rafting the wagons across the stream with her, and it was obvious he was a little worried about how to do it. The oxen are well-trained, but I'm not exactly a well-trained oxen driver. He shook his head. They should make you take a class to learn to drive before they let you loose on the trail. She smiled. I haven't seen you try to do anything you weren't excellent at doing. That either means you have practiced doing many things, and you will only do those things you are already good at, or you are naturally good at most things. Which is it? He laughed. You give me confidence. I'm glad. We've only been on the trail for four days, so it's nice if you still have confidence. And we've been married six days. Tomorrow we'll make seven. Are you ready to be married for a week? I think I've liked the past twelve hours of marriage more than any other, she answered honestly. Though she hadn't enjoyed the marriage act quite as much as he had, she had loved how close she felt to him. She loved lying in his arms afterward. All in all, it felt good to her. Glad to hear it. We may have to have a repeat of last night's activity soon. She had packed everything but the coffee pot and the plates they were eating on when the men gathered to try to get the first wagon across the river. First, they loaded Captain Bedwell's wagon onto a raft and floated it across, and when that went well, they began with the other wagons. Without an experienced ferryman this crossing took much longer than the last had, and they worked well into the afternoon getting all the wagons and all of the pioneers across onto the other side of the river. They didn't take a break for the noon meal, because the captain was determined to be able to continue along the trail that day, and the women watched with worried expressions as their men went much longer than usual without food. Finally, when she could stand it no more, Hannah took a bowl of cold beans to her husband, and she watched as many of the other women followed suit. The men ate standing up, and they took turns at it, but they ate. At just before four that afternoon, all of the wagons were across the river, but it was really time to stop for the day. They set up camp in the spot where they could see many others before them had camped across the river from where they'd stayed the previous night. There was a skeleton of a baby not far from the campsite that some of the children found, and there were marks on one of the legs where a wolf had obviously gnawed at it. Hannah couldn't help but shed a few tears for the mother who had lost her child in some horrific fashion. At that moment she grew slightly morose, looking around her and wondering which of the people she'd already grown to call her friends would die. For one out of every five who set out for Oregon never arrived. Chapter 8 April 1, 1852 We spent all day doing our best to make it across the Wolf River. Finally, late this afternoon, we floated the last wagon across the river. Tonight, we will camp across the river from the place we camped last night, and tomorrow we will travel along the river. While we men worked to get the wagons across the river, Miss Mitchell shot two deer and two antelopes. That will feed the train for the night, and we will all share in the bounty. 
I have a feeling she is supplying a great many people with the food they need for the journey, but I have not yet had this confirmed. I do know she has fed us a few nights, and I will give her powder and balls to make up for what she has used to help us. So far, our journey has been much easier than expected, and I thank God for that hourly. He is providing for us in an amazing way. I continue to ask for his blessing to get us to Oregon in one piece. That evening was festive. The doctor got out his Jew's harp, Jamie Pruitt his guitar, and Malcolm Bentley his fiddle. The three of them played well into the night, and all of the settlers danced. Jeremiah Mitchell was carried out so he could at least watch the dancing and hear the music, even if he couldn't participate. The doctor was pleased with how his foot was healing, and they were all thankful he shouldn't have to lose the foot. Hannah found her energy for the dancing was better now that she'd been walking so much, and she didn't have to take any breaks. Finally, as the men were finishing up for the night and everyone was turning in, Jed told Hannah to get a blanket, and they walked downriver from the campground to enjoy some time together. They sat and talked for a while, not really discussing anything of great importance, but they both talked of their hopes for the future. Jed talked of the church he wanted and the family atmosphere he wanted from the congregation. And I want to have a good, solid farm. It doesn't have to be huge, but I want to have enough milk to make cheese and butter. I'll grow my own feed for the cows during the summer, and we'll have a big, red barn. Hannah smiled, imagining it. And we'll have a house with a small kitchen garden, and I'll grow carrots, potatoes, barley, and green beans. I want a white house, and I want it to have actual bedrooms. And I want a bathtub so I can take baths whenever I want. When you dig the well, I want it to be close to the house so I don't have to travel far to get the water for cooking and cleaning. Maybe we can find some nice rolling hills to live in. And raise children. He looked at her. Do you want a lot of children? I'd like at least four or five. I never did like being an only child, but my mother just never got pregnant again after me. So, if we're going to make lots of babies, do you think we should practice making them? Hannah laughed softly. That sounds like a good idea to me. She moved to him readily on the blanket, knowing now what to expect. When her mother had first told her about the marriage bed, it hadn't sounded pleasant to her at all. But when she and Jed made love, it was a special experience. It didn't take them long to lose their clothes and to again move together as if they were one. When they'd finished, he rolled off her to her side. Tomorrow's going to be a hard day. She nodded. At least we know we'll be staying along the Wolf River tomorrow, and there won't be any need to look for more water for camping. That's true. He got up and put his clothes on, and she followed suit, walking back to camp with him. She yawned as he put up their tent, and she quickly grabbed her journal. I need to write about today, before I forget. Hannah quickly scribbled out her thoughts for the day, and she tucked the journal back into her trunk. Then she caught the kittens who were snuggled together in the back of the wagon, and took them into the tent with her and Jed. She wanted them to stay warm as well, and they could snuggle with one of the humans if they needed to. Asterisk. Rain hit the small group the following day for the first time since they'd left Independence. It was cold and dreary, and when they stopped around two in the afternoon, they were all chilled to the bone. Hannah quickly built up a fire, and she changed out of her wet clothes. Someone's going to get sick from this, she said worriedly to Mary. I agree. We're all going to have to be extra careful to get warm tonight. Mary hurried off to join her family. I guess we're all doing beans tonight, Hannah said to no one in particular. The visibility had been low due to the rain, and Mary hadn't been able to shoot any critters at all. Hannah was a little disappointed, but she knew she would make it work. It was her job to provide good meals for her husband, and she had promised her mother she would do the best job she possibly could. She wouldn't bring shame on her family. When Jed joined her, he immediately set up their tent 
and Hannah huddled inside it as she waited for the beans to boil. It hadn't been easy to even get the fire started, and now she was going to have to cook in the rain. Somehow, she'd never imagined there would be rain on the trail. The mountains, the rivers, the cold, she'd been ready for all those things, but not for the rain. She said a quick prayer to thank God for giving them rain after they crossed the river and not before. She sincerely hoped the plat wouldn't be too high when they got there, but she knew that was down the road. There would certainly be no slipping away late at night to make love under the stars tonight, but perhaps the sound of the rain would make it okay to make love right there in camp. Once they'd eaten, she washed the dishes by quickly rinsing them in the rainwater from the opening of the tent. There was no camaraderie that evening as everyone tried to keep out of the freezing rain. She wrote in her journal before taking the kittens into the tent with her and Jed, both of them shaking with the cold. She wished they had just one more blanket to add to the small pile covering them, but she wasn't sure where she'd get one from out here on the trail. She fell asleep with Jed's arms wrapped around her, and she finally felt warm for the first time all day. Asterisk. The following day they traveled along the Wolf River again, and they made good time. It was still muddy, and one of the wagons got stuck early in the morning, but the men worked together and got it going within an hour, and they simply moved later into the afternoon when possible. They camped around five that day and were all pleased to have left the cold rain behind them. The musicians once again took their instruments out, and a card game was organized. Hannah and Jed played against Mary and Bob Hastings. They played a game called Euchre, which neither Mary or Hannah had played, but Jed had played in Illinois growing up and Bob had played in Wisconsin. The game was fun, if a bit complicated to learn. Mary and Bob were expert teammates, though, and they won each game, hands down. After the game, Mary stole a few minutes with Hannah. I think I saw buffalo tracks today. I cannot wait until I'm able to actually shoot one. It would feed the whole camp. It would. And we could make jerky out of everything that's left. Mary wrinkled her nose. I hate making jerky, but I'd help because you're my friend. Hannah laughed. So, what is going on between you and Mr. Hastings? Do you have feelings for him? No. Absolutely not. Just because you're happily married doesn't mean I ever will be. No, you will not try to marry me off. I'm better alone. Mary shook her head emphatically. Are you sure? Hannah asked. She was more teasing her friend than anything else. I'm sure. Trust me. I am not meant to marry. When Hannah returned to camp, Jed had already prepared for bed. She joined him in their tent, and they listened to the campground, which was mostly quiet around them. I had fun playing cards with them, Jed said softly, burying his face in her fiery hair. More than anything else about her, her hair fascinated him. It went down to almost her knees, and he wanted to wind it around his wrists. I'm glad. I like anything I do with Mary. She's a fun person. She is convinced she saw buffalo tracks today, and she wants to shoot her first buffalo. She said it'll feed the entire wagon train, and I told her I'd make jerky from what was left with her. That sounds good to me, Jed said. I happen to be a big fan of jerky. You'll find a lot of it in the back of the wagon, but I'm trying not to use it. We need to be able to still eat when we get to Oregon. I'm doing my best to be very frugal with our food. How's Mrs. Balling and the girls doing? Better than I expected at first. Mrs. Balling is a lot stronger than she looks. The girls are learning to play on the trail and not spend all of their time dreading the walking. It does help that they nap all afternoon every day. She hid a loud yawn behind her hand. I can't believe I'm so tired. Tomorrow Sunday, he said softly. We'll have church services right after lunchtime. That way the women can get the laundry washed in the morning, and hopefully it will be dry before nightfall. That's the plan anyway. 
What's your sermon on tomorrow? She asked. Moses in the wilderness. I'm going to compare the meat we've been able to kill to manna from heaven. That sounds like something we all need. It should really be enjoyable. Hannah frowned. I'm not looking forward to doing the laundry in a river. Well, of course not. I wouldn't be either, but the trail has hardships for all of us. I do feel like the men's work is done as soon as the wagons are stopped for the evening. The women keep working until after supper. I think the trail is much harder on you women than it is on men. I don't deny it. I'm just glad I have you with me. Hannah, I don't think you understand what you're coming to mean to me. Hannah sighed happily. I hope I mean as much to you as you're coming to mean to me. She'd been facing away from him, but she turned over and kissed him, his arms coming around her. Let's just try to be quiet this time. Jed nodded, deepening their kiss. If she wanted to stay there to make love, then he was happy to do it. Asterisk. Sunday ended up being a good day to rest. The oxen needed a rest as much as the humans did. Hannah woke to the sound of the gunshot, and she immediately got a fire started and made coffee. Then she went down to the river to start the huge chore of doing laundry in a river. Mary joined her soon after she started, and the two of them together scrubbed clothes. Mary sang as she worked, and Hannah sat quietly listening to her friend. I had no idea you could sing so well, she said when her friend became quiet. Mary shrugged. I don't like to really sing in front of people, but I do love singing. It's a mostly private thing. I'm really comfortable around you, so I can sing when it's just the two of us. On both sides of them, there were women up and down the river working on their laundry. When Mrs. Balling finished her laundry, she hung it between two wagons to dry, but then she did something that surprised Hannah. What are you doing? Mrs. Balling simply smiled. I want to thank you for your generosity. Give me a few minutes and then come see me. Mrs. Balling had been parking her wagon beside her and Jed's tent every night because they had become friends. As soon as Hannah finished hanging the clothes, she walked to the other woman's wagon. Her hand immediately went over her mouth. What have you done? I brought my bathtub with me, and I filled it after heating some of the water. I want you and Miss Mitchell to have the first two baths, because you both have done so much to help me. Mrs. Balling had put the tub between two wagons, and she'd hung sheets to hide the bathtub. I'll charge everyone but you two. Hannah didn't need to be told twice. Bless you, Mrs. Balling. Please call me Margaret. Then you must call me Hannah. I'd be happy to. Margaret left the small enclosed area she'd made, and Hannah stripped and got into the tub. She threw her dress over one of the blankets Margaret had hung to make her curtain, and she sank as deep into the water as she could. Of course, the tub wasn't as nice as the one Hannah had used back home, but it was a far cry better than the freezing cold river, which was her only other option. She was careful not to take too long in the bath, because she knew Mary would want to turn while the water was still warm, and she needed to cook something for lunch for her husband. After she'd dried off and gotten dressed, she walked back to her husband feeling like a new woman. Margaret drew me a bath. She was practically dancing with joy at the feeling of having all the dirt off her skin. Jed smiled. I helped her with the water. Oh, thank you. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You are the very best of husbands. She threw herself into his arms and held tight. Jed laughed. You're just happy because you're clean. He knew it had bothered her, but there had been nothing he could do about it until that morning. That's a lot of it. I have another surprise. You cannot keep giving me presents. Hannah protested. Oh, this is a present as much for me as it is for you. He pointed to a deer he had hanging upside down from a tree down by the river. I thought it might be nice to have a good supper. May I share some with Margaret? 
she asked, immediately thinking of her friend. You know, you are the very best of wives, for a preacher. You always think of others first. Hannah shook her head. Not at all. I thought about how it would taste in a nice thick stew, before I thought about my friend. She pursed her lips. I'm going to invite Margaret and the girls to eat with us tonight, if I may. She drives all day, cooks at night, and still minds her children. She's doing men's and women's work every day. Yes, I think you should invite her for supper. It would be good for her and the girls to eat someone else's cooking for once. Dig deep in the food box, and I have a few potatoes and a few carrots. I didn't buy a lot, but they'll help to make a perfect meal for company. She stood on tiptoe and kissed his cheek. Thank you, Jed. She got out the leftovers from the previous night and for once was able to warm up their noon meal. Both of them ate quietly, and then he found a good place for his sermon. He sat on a rock, and the others crowded around, ready to receive a message about their God. As Hannah watched him preach, her eyes were filled with love and praise for the man she was married to. His words filled her with hope, and she could see from the faces of the other emigrants that they were filled with hope as well. After the sermon, several of the men shook his hand and thanked him for preaching. I'll share the next meat I get with you, Pastor. This morning, I was able to get a deer, so I'm set for tonight. But we're happy to take any meat you don't need. He smiled, obviously thankful that his words had an impact on so many different people there in the camp. Many of the men went hunting that afternoon, and Jed joined them, hoping to get a couple more deer or anything else that happened along. The more he could help Mrs. Balling with food, the less Hannah would be worried about the other woman and her family. Shortly after the men had left for their hunt, Margaret hurried over to Hannah. I can't find Sally. She was sleeping in the wagon beside Amanda, but now she's missing. I need your help. Hannah nodded, and she called out to the other women and children who were left in camp. Mary had apparently gone on the hunt with the men, but all of the other women were still there, and they all started searching right away. Margaret was beside herself with worry, crying hysterically. What if she's out where the men are hunting? She could be accidentally shot. We're all looking everywhere, Margaret. I promise you she'll be found. Hannah hurried off, looking at all the wagons in the circle. When she'd reached back at the beginning wagon, which was Margaret's, she looked inside just to be sure the child hadn't returned when no one was looking. Sure enough, little Sally was sleeping beside her sister. She called as loud as she could, I found her. The other women came running, and she pointed into the wagon at the two little girls sleeping side by side. Margaret was the first to arrive by her side, and she was still crying. I think she's been there the whole time, Hannah said calmly, smiling at her friend. She couldn't imagine what terror would be felt by a mother with a lost child. Margaret threw her arms around Hannah. Oh, thank heavens. I thought I'd lost her for good. We're not going to let that happen, Hannah said. That's why we're all traveling together. The other women reassured her, and soon after, the camp had returned to its usual quiet when the men were away. I'm fixing a venison stew tonight, and I'm making enough for your family and mine. Margaret, who had finally calmed, burst out crying again. I haven't done anything to help you, and you and the pastor have been so generous with me and my girls. I feel like I need to do something in return. You heated water for me to take a bath today. Hannah said. It was a comfort I didn't think I'd have until we got to Oregon. How can you say you've done nothing for me? Margaret smiled. I did that to thank you, and here you are doing more to thank me. I am so glad this was the wagon train I chose. It's like having a sister right here with me. You and Mary have both made my life so much easier since the trip started. Hannah nodded. And when you think about it, the trip is still a great deal harder for you than for anyone else. You're doing men's and women's work every day. 
but that's because my husband died. I should have to do both. No, you shouldn't. The Bible says we need to help the widows and orphans, and you and your children are both. We will help you. I'd quote the actual scripture, but I don't remember where it is. I wish Jed was here. Margaret smiled. Don't worry about that. Why don't we cook supper together? I'll help you chop the vegetables and do whatever else you plan to do while the girls sleep. Maybe this evening I can simply spend some time with my babies and not worry about anything else. That sounds good to me. Are any of the men bringing you meat in exchange for meals yet? Jed said he'd tell everyone you were willing. Not yet. But you and Mary have made sure I had meat if anyone did. I'm sure they will further on down the road. Margaret looked a bit skeptical about whether she and her girls would actually make it, but Hannah was determined if they could survive that they would. When the men came back to camp, Hannah Stew was simmering over the fire. Jed walked over and smiled. That smells so good. Margaret had some spices we added to the pot, she said. Well, thank you, Margaret. You're supposed to be resting tonight so that Hannah could cook for you. Well, I'm going to rest and spend time with my girls after I finish helping Hannah with the supper dishes. Hannah turned from the fire. I let you help me cook, but you are not going to help me with the dishes. You spend all the time you can with your girls. You'll have enough to do tomorrow. Margaret looked conflicted for a moment, and then she smiled. I'm thankful, Hannah. Don't worry about it. We love the idea of helping you. Jed smiled at his wife, realizing that she really was the perfect preacher's wife. The way he had found her was ridiculous. Her stepfather had been wanting to all but sell her, which he was sure Hannah didn't realize. Well, it wasn't really selling her, because Jed had been paid to take her away. The stew turned out beautifully, and Margaret made biscuits to go with the meal. When the pastor prayed over the meal, he made sure to mention how thankful he was to be able to share the meal with a special family. Little Sally looked around her. What special family? Hannah laughed and poked the little girl's belly. Your special family. We're feeling happy that you're allowing us to eat with you. After supper, Hannah shooed Margaret and her girls away. I will come get the girls in the morning before we start out again. You are such a blessing to me, Hannah. I do hope you know that. As Hannah watched the young widow lead her children away, she said to Jed, I was certain I would be a horrible pastor's wife. I thought I would make everyone think less of you in the beginning. I think I'm doing all right. You are definitely doing all right. You're the perfect wife for me in every way. At first, I wondered about your upbringing because you had obviously had a much more privileged upbringing than most. But I was wrong, because you are better with people and more loving than any pastor's wife I've ever seen. Hannah felt tears pop into her eyes at his words. She was doing something right to get that kind of praise from her husband. He wasn't one to praise lightly. When she wrote in her journal, she mentioned how thankful she was for the man she'd married. He truly was the man she needed in her life.